Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am very excited to join you today from... Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good, every, uh, good everything, everything to everyone. Uh, I am happily joining this Twitch stream today amidst a chaos of deliveries and other issues. So I am very happy to introduce today Josh Woods. He is joining us. And then Eric Jacobs will be joining us here in a few minutes. Uh, I believe he had some deliveries as well show up at the same time. So um yeah is there the christian is complaining of echo i am not hearing any echo christian All right. Sorry. So uh, Josh Woods, he is known for uh, a book. Uh, believe it or not, they, they let uh, Josh Woods write a book. Uh, um, that's actually one of my favorite books, to be honest with you, because it has helped me so much learn about Kubernetes operators. Uh, I don't have a physical copy, Josh, because, you know, the times we're in. But I did print out a cover for everyone to see. You can go to uh, just just Google it. Kubernetes operators ebook. Uh, it's on Red Hat dot com. Uh, I will drop a link in chat here in a moment. But yes, Jason Dobies, who was on yesterday, and Joshua Wood, who wrote this wonderful book on Kubernetes operators. Josh, can you tell us a little bit about like the experience of writing a book, a technical book like this? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can. And, and thanks for mentioning it, Chris. And, and before I dive in, I'll say one thing. If you uh, shoot me an email sometime with address info, I can make sure you get a book. A oh, copy. well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll even, I'll scribble in it for you. Um, so yeah, the process, um, we had lots and lots of help from, of course, a ton of people at Red Hat. Um, Dobies and I are both developer advocates. And while I have a long history with, with operators originating from my time at CoreOS, and this has kind of been a focus for me for what is an accumulating number of years, uh, as hard as that is to believe, um, Dobies was fairly new and that gave us a really good kind of platform of a good knowledge of the basics and a good knowledge of what somebody who's just coming to it needs to know to get the basics down to under you to understand how to uh, start using and how to start writing Kubernetes operators. Um, so the book focuses on Red Hat's operator framework and SDK tools for the mechanism for writing that. And as far as like how the book uh, had like what writing the book was like, um, we had a ton of help from the folks at O'Reilly who published it and in, 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 in uh, started the project, uh, and from a lot of the folks at Red Hat who are in operators project management um, or working directly on building operators and the operator lifecycle management framework that's such a big part of how we deliver the features we add on top of Kubernetes uh, in OpenShift. So we had recourse to a lot of expertise and we're not trying to write it entirely out of our own empty heads. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the most challenging thing in doing all of this is that we're dealing with something that's still really rapidly evolving, especially in the framework and the SDK tools. While a lot of the thinking and sort of conceptual model of operators has been in place for a good amount of time and we see maturity around it in partners and vendors who are delivering operators into the operator hub, the tools that we use to build operators and the underlying Kubernetes abstractions that operate, operators rely on and leverage continue to change rapidly. So throughout the course of the book, we get a chapter drafted and into place and we would constantly be having to do a walk back through and reviewing what we were doing and trying to make sure that at least at the moment we delivered the book to the presses, it was as up to date as it could possibly be. So for example, I already know of a couple instances in the SDK where, yeah. where we need to make updates and where that'll be noted in like sort of errata pages for the book. Um, that have happened even in the month and a half since since the book printed uh, in in March. That yeah, I was about to say like that is like it, the the fact that 
a you you wanted you wanted to write this book knowing full good and well that the pattern is still it's a pattern it's an established pattern it's a good practice you know we, we've established that but like the actual underneath bits are going to be changing very rapidly and that right. includes the stk kubernetes the whole nine yards and you know also this whole this whole thing you know, as as we're evolving here, uh, you know, we're donating the framework and potentially OLM and you know, Operator Hub is out there for now. Uh, but the the framework itself, Operator SDK framework, uh, is being donated to CNCS. So this is not just a Red Hat thing. Yeah. You can use. Kubernetes operators on any Kubernetes cluster, right? Like it's not, we, we, you know, we sponsored the book. We're giving it away for free on the website. I just dropped in chat, but you can use these operators or the operator pattern in general on any cluster. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And it, and it even extends to, to one of the things that I think is the neatest part of what we built out of the pattern. And that is this idea of an operator lifecycle manager. Uh, mm -hmm. What is OLM? Well, Operators uh, automate and manage the software they run. OLM automates and manages operators for a cluster. And OLM, while it is, again, essential to how we're building features on top of the Kubernetes core of our OpenShift uh, distribution, it's also available in a bolt-on that you could add to any bog standard Kubernetes cluster and then begin consuming operators from operatorhub.io and other catalog sources where, where vendors have mature operators already already in the market consumable in one way or another. So I think that's a really important note that you make that, that while this is intrinsic to a lot of how we deliver OpenShift, it's been designed in a way to be modular to any Kubernetes cluster, exactly. which is, is what the book focuses on certainly. And in the exercises in the book, we use mostly uh, uh, Minikube uh, to illustrate th this very fact. So mm -hmm. if you look in the later chapters, you'll see an OLM bolted on top of Minikube. Um, and we use that for our build and deployment environment in the uh, the hands-on examples in the book. Cool. That's awesome. So, you know, Eric just said he was on his way. Uh, he, <laughs> To be honest, he had a delivery right as we were joining. So that's why we were a little delayed. So his doorbell rang. He had to sign for it and all that fun stuff. So now he is on his walking treadmill. It looks like joining us from a far off land. Um, hey, Eric, how's it going? Well, he says he's good. I can't hear him, though. Uh-oh. Eric with the audio issues. I don't know if that's cool. You can do it, Eric. I believe. I believe I can fly. I just want to believe we can hear him. I just want to believe we can hear him. No, nothing, <laughs> Eric. Got nothing. Nope, nothing. Nope, still nothing. Unplug it, plug it back in again. Or is it unplugged completely today? <laughs> Yesterday he joined and I was like, I can't hear you. What's going on? Normally I have no problem. And he had to plug in his headset. Still it's not working though, Eric. No, nothing. I got nothing, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, Eric, the, the hint I could maybe offer is that Zoom made unexpected choices for both my input and output sources when I... That's true. Uh, it, 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 I've, you know, I've used it before, but I had unexpected choices for those two items when I opened it today. I did too. Uh, yeah, actually, I had to uh, adjust all my settings and like replug stuff in and everything. So yeah, something in some Zoom update somewhere has potentially maybe uh, changed our defaults. So yeah. Well, so, uh, so yeah, Josh, yeah, so uh, we're talking about Prometheus today, or did you want to talk about that? Yeah, and, and, yeah. and so I, having gotten my shameless plug for, for my, my literary output out of the way, uh, um, what we are going to talk about today uh, and, and why we brought Eric um, as the SME for this particular uh, feature is we're going to talk about the new um, uh, user workload monitoring features previewed in OpenShift 4.3 and GA and OpenShift 4.4 that allow yeah, you to yeah, leverage OpenShift's Prometheus monitoring uh, and alerting system with your own applications uh, in a fairly easy and plug and play way. I think we can hear Eric now. So I'll we can hear Eric, Eric now. Um, oh, but can I share a single desktop? Ooh, ooh maybe this will work. The question. Oh, I see screen. I am very happy. Yay, Eric. All right. 
Is that working? Yeah, that's working. So we, we see your uh, Zoom cool. login page. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I caught myself by surprise because I forgot sort of what we were going to do. Man, no, you didn't forget. You just well, forgot. no. I mean, we, I, I've been talking to Josh about this, and it was like Josh doesn't really know kind of how the stuff works, and we had talked, and then it was like, oh, I thought he was going to drive, but then I realized that I probably need to drive because I'm the one who's actually going to write the code, maybe also. Um, <laughs> you know, all kinds of, all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I was trying to get set up, so I didn't totally pay attention to the ground that you covered on metrics and monitoring and what we know and what we don't know. So we were just getting started. Also, if you could turn your input up a little bit, that'd be great. Volume? Yes. Your volume. You are very quiet. We get to watch you do this live. Finding the zoom settings. Yeah which are hard to find while I'm sharing my screen. No, I got it. I hear you. Uh, uh, they are, you uh, go to that little uh, Zoom window thing that sense. hangs off. There you go. The, the, the audio volume is all the way up. So let me try wow, okay. something else here. Sound. Maybe I can. This is the joy of live streaming, folks, right? Like nothing goes perfectly. Uh, it, it wants, we will get to a point in this process where Do we have this know. down, we think. Yeah, that volume is definitely there. We go. No, nope, that now? one's all the way up too. Okay, well, I guess that's as good as we get. I don't, I don't know how to get any louder. Uh, you sound better now, a little bit. I think you just moving your mic helped. Uh, okay, so yeah, I don't know. Let's keep. Yeah, sounds good. Let's I'll keep try pushing. Scream. Yeah. So I hear that we're talking about mon <laughs> <laughs> from the hilltops, Prometheus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've got an OpenShift 4.4 cluster here, which I'm not sure if it's the GA release software because uh, I don't know what our demo system gave me, but such is life. Um, yeah, it, to be clear, our demo what, system what has Eric is, beta. What Eric references there for the audience is what we were hinting at in that little intro that Chris and I were talking while, while Eric was coming online, which is the, the features we're going to be looking at today were... Uh, uh, a technology preview in OpenShift 4.3, and I've reached our GA state in OpenShift 4.4. So even if we're looking at a little bit of a pre-baked uh, version of 4.4, this is where the features GA, and that is the the user workload monitoring feature uh, with OpenShift's built-in Prometheus that, that we're going to be using to monitor our own application uh, today's session. Cool. Uh, so, so let's do a couple things here. I'll get a folder set up here for our uh, So more or less, I came to Eric and said, hey, I'm an OpenShift dev advocate. I'm generally well educated. This is a new feature. Prometheus is I'm not something I'm deeply familiar with. And Prometheus has sort of its own uh, DSL, PromQL, for writing queries and an alerting system for triggering alerts. And I know that a lot of these features are maturing in OpenShift's delivery of them. So what we wanted to do was literally have him walk me through learning how, how to use these features. Um, yeah. So I'm making a folder uh, called Sinatra Metrics. So I'm a weird person, and I like Ruby as a program. Weird language. about that? I mean, you know, I like a lot of different languages. Does that make me weird? <laughs> no, but okay. most people think that Ruby people are weird. So hmm. such is life. Uh, this repository has too many active changes. Yeah, that's fine. So my gonna, life. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's like I have my entire home folder as a Git repo, but I, I have most of it ignored. But anyway, so we'll just make a new repo here to make VS Code less angry. Um, so we'll go into our, we'll try to go into our OpenShift environment and let's create a project for our, um, for our metrics. So we'll call this metrics playground. Right. And, and for folks who might not know or who are tuning in to learn about OpenShift and OpenShift facilities, I'll briefly say projects are kind of OpenShift's version of namespaces, namespaces on steroids and a way of isolating teams and, and the work of individual teams or individual developers from one another safely on single cluster deployments. 
Hey, Eric, uh, can you zoom or increase the size of your browser when you get a second? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You got it. Okay, so here's a simple Sinatra Ruby application. Uh, Sinatra is basically one of these um, Ruby. Frameworks. Well, Sinatra is not really a framework. It's more just like a uh, like a server, if you will. Um, and it's one okay. of these real basic ones that like you got to tell it everything you want it to do. So in this case, um, so me writing Go code is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, I, I have to tell it, OK, you're going to respond to slash get. Uh, sorry, you're going to respond to a get request on slash with just the text. Hello, world. Nice. All right, pretty basic. So the first thing we're going to do is all right, I've got this code. So uh, let me reopen this folder to make um, VS Code get more happy now that I have a repo in here. Sinatra metrics. Increase the font size of VS Code too. Uh, even more. Screen. Yeah. Wow, I feel like uh, I feel like a very old person right now. You, you can maximize the window to have more space. If you I can, like, uh, but yeah. it still doesn't go. make me feel any less old. Well, you know, uh, it, it makes me feel younger because I can sit further back. How do I? I don't, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying. Now I'm just fighting with VS Code. Like it still has this stupid main. Oh, I get. I didn't commit anything. Hmm. This is the fun of live streaming, right? So get, get status. All right, get add dot get commit initial commit. Okay, fine. So how do I? Well, I, I think you have your project open for your whole home folder rather than the project for the Yeah, but I just I literally reopened this folder. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll open it again. Maybe it'll behave better now. But it keeps wanting to oh, let's do this new window. Close this window. File open recent folder. Oh, much happier. Okay, cool. Oh, there we go. All right, so I have this basic thing, and so what I'm going to do, yes, thank you, Solar Graph, <laughs> lovely. Okay, so what I want, I'm going to take advantage or try to take advantage of um, the source to image framework, uh, which OpenShift knows how to use. And so source to image is just a way to combine um, an existing base image with application code. And so what I'm going to do is just make an actual repo on GitHub because that's public. And I think I called this Sinatra Metrics. Uh, metrics. Uh, it's public. Create a repository. That's fine. We will do this. And we will git add remote. Oh, we need to give it a name. Origin. Get remote add. Yep. Pair programming at its finest. Woohoo. So push that code to master. OK, great. So we finally have some code in the public. It's just a Sinatra right. app. So I think a, a quick summary there is probably useful. You're going to use a Ruby builder within OpenShift to, we'll get to, to that, generate yeah. a container to run this code in. Yeah. And in order to do that, you're making your repo available publicly so you can aim your OpenShift cluster at it as a exactly. place to fetch your code. Yep. Yeah, we're off to pick up code. So we have our metrics playground project. I'll switch to the developer view. The uh, the 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 let me chime in there. So there's an administrator view that we're all familiar with, I think, um, on my team. Uh, we've introduced a developer view that makes this a lot easier for the developer to just get up and running as fast as they can, not have to see all the stuff on the side about, you know, cluster metrics and everything else, right? Like that's for the ops or the admins of the cluster. Over here in the developer pane, this is where we start deploying code and getting crazy with you know metrics and everything else. Right, right. I would I would say the developer pers perspective is intensely focused on application code mm -hmm. and on a topological representation of the components of your app running on the cluster, um, as opposed to the admin view, which is a lot about like how many nodes are in the cluster, what's the load average on each of them, and, and ops teams sort of concerns, as, as you mentioned. Chris. Right. So like me personally, I spend a lot of my time in the administrator view, uh, but when I'm on these uh, live streams, I spend a lot of time in the developer view and it's fun. I get both, it's awesome. I'm letting people know what we're doing. 
with a tweet. Oh, you thanks. Yes. Okay. I did tweet off stuff uh, scheduled. I should mostly. probably Facebook post too, but then I got to open another uh, browser. No, and uh, uh, what? I have friends on Facebook who do technology stuff, man. No, I have friends on Facebook too, but like opening the browser and then opening it's... Facebook, I know what that's going to do to the quality of the stream. So, well, I can do know. it on my phone. <laughs> Get repo you URL. Do it on your okay. Phone. <laughs> so now we want our clone URL, but we don't have SSH, so I need the regular HTTP URL. So we paste that in here. Show advanced options. Uh, I don't need to do anything fancy because it's all just in master and then the base, whatever. Unable to detect the builder image. I'm pretty confident this is going to be a problem, and, and I know why it's going to be a problem, but we're going to break it anyway just for funsies. Oh, um, yes. So it's Ruby. OK. Uh, two five sounds good enough for me. Sure, why not? All right. Um, what do we want to call this? I don't want to call it Sinatra Mythic Git app. So we'll call it that. And there's so two different names. There's the name of the application, which is really the name of the grouping. Right. And then there's the name of the resources. So I'm going to call them both the same thing. I could call them something different, whatever. Do I want a deployment or a deployment config? Um, you'll, you'll hear us talking about this one a lot. Um, deployment is standard Kubernetes capital G deployment. Uh, so if you know about that and how it uses replica sets, you know, that's great. Deployment config gives us a couple of extra bells and whistles. And one of them is um, automatically redeploying when things change. And since we're definitely going to be changing this code a whole lot, um, we're going to want to take advantage of that. So we're going to use a deployment config. We should probably do. We could probably do a Twitch episode that's just all about the differences between about the some differences, of these things. Yeah, but to give a, a quick overview and summary, and, and to extend the one that, that Eric just touched on a little, is analogous to what we were talking about with projects as a sort of accentuated uh, a version of what namespaces do in default or standard Kubernetes or. Uh, uh, plain vanilla Kubernetes, uh, deployment configs are analogous to deployments in the same way. There are additional OpenShift features that we've, uh, that we've built on top of the fundamental abstractions to enable some developer convenience features like uh, triggering rebuilds that, that Eric is, is specifically using in, in this scenario. Sweet. And then lastly, we're going to create a route. Uh, routes are similar to ingress. Um, but again, we've got some extra cool OpenShift enterprise bells and whistles that go along with routes, um, but this is going to expose our application at a public URL. So we'll go ahead and create this. Whoa, that's a big Ruby icon. Look at that. That is a big Ruby uh, icon. And so what's happening right now is that there's a build running or, or starting or getting ready to get fired off. Right. And what we see here is OpenShift has spun up the builder image, the, the Ruby-based builder base image. All your base are belong to Red Hat. Um, and then it pulls in the code, and then it runs a build process. But you'll see it actually didn't do anything. And this is going to explode in a ball of fire in a moment because uh, I left something out, but I sort of did it on purpose. So but anyway. a question in chat, uh, oh, I don't like and it. it's from Christian. So Christian Hernandez? Yes, our Christian. Does it assume Rails? Is that why? So you're kind of on the right path, but not, not totally on the right path. So here we go. It starts to pull in the image, and then it starts doing all kinds of buildy stuff. And then it runs the assemble script. And the assemble script builds my Ruby application. Well, if we think about Java and building, usually that's like Maven. And if we think about Python and building, that's kind of like pip install and doing some other stuff. So Ruby uses gem file. But I mm -hmm. forgot to actually have a gem you, file. You, you so, didn't put on. Oops. So yeah. Uh, my oops. Bad. So that's why oops. I couldn't detect what my source code was, because it's looking for key files in the repo that help identify the language that should be used. So when I put in the source repo URL and it it in, it introspected my repo. It looked at all the files, and it's like, well, I don't see anything. I don't see a Maven file. I don't see an ant file. I don't see a gem file. I don't see a pip requirements.txt. Like, I have no idea what the heck this language is. It doesn't just assume that because there's a ruby.rb file that it's Ruby. Right. So anyway, this is going to finish building and combining all the things. It's going to push the image into the internal registry. And then it's going to try and deploy it, and it's going to fail because nothing, there's nothing to run. It doesn't even know what to do. 
Crash. So it, it runs the run script, but there's nothing to run. So, OK. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to our code. What is wrong um, with our actually, code? Actually, go ahead. What is wrong with our code? Well, sort of. But what I'm actually going <laughs> to do here is I'm going to try to do something silly slash not silly. Uh, here's the build configuration. Um, and then what I think I can do is where is the webhook URL? Hey, look at that. So nice. GitHub, um, sorry, let me back up. Uh, builds and OpenShift have the ability to be integrated with webhooks. And so I can tell GitHub to call my cluster anytime the repo changes. And so as soon as I upload code, it hits OpenShift and says, hey, something happened. OpenShift goes, oh, that means I'm supposed to do a new build. So we're like already doing CI with almost no effort. Um, so let me come in here to the, uh, to the GitHub. I'll make this bigger. Uh, settings on the repo, webhooks, uh, add a webhook, payload URL. Uh, URL form encoded is fine. The secret is embedded in the URL itself, so I don't need to put anything in here. I need to disable SSL verification because my OpenShift cluster does not use any um, known CA. CA. Yeah, yeah all, so the SSL time. cert that is exposed by my cluster is not known to GitHub. Um, well, the, the CA is not known to GitHub. So if you know anything about how all that junk works, basically, like, it's I not know. a... Well, I know you know how, but I don't <laughs> want to bother. Do, do we want to go into PKI infrastructure and all this stuff? On the, I mean, we on can. The, we got to, uh, if you want. It's your call, uh, man. No, I don't okay. want to. We'll let Christian do that when he does DNS. So anyway, um, so we got to disable SSL verification. Um, just push the event, I think, is fine. We'll leave it active, fine. Add webhook. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know why that last delivery was not successful. Why? Hmm. All right. Oops, wrong, wrong tab. So many, so many windows. So little time. Well, that certainly isn't going to work right. <laughs> That's GitHub. Copy link address. Um, curl. Why? Why is it not copying the link? It can you? I, like, I what blame. is it at the end of the line? <laughs> I don't get that. There we huh, go. Okay, okay. That's that's fine. Curl K. Uh -huh. All Ooh. right. Well, that I mean Some kind that of failure. works. It's a four hundred three. I don't know why. What was the error here? Ping. Oh, that's fine. It actually worked. It's just the whatever answer it got back, it didn't like. Hmm. OK. I think. Because that's the headers. Oh, the response. Sorry. Yeah, that's OK. Failure. Unsupported content. Totally cool. We're good. Uh, do we just have the type wrong? Like we No, need I don't think it response. matters. OK. Um, I think it's just it it didn't like what we told it, but that's fine. It wasn't it wasn't that it couldn't find it. It was just you know it wasn't supposed to work anyway. You know what? Let's ask the docs. Why can't to the docs. <laughs> when in doubt, that's why we write them, right? I mean, that's not why I don't write the docs. But anyway, triggering and we. modifying builds. Here we go. I said we. Uh, webhook triggers, GitHub, GitLab, OC new app, webhook key, secret, blah, 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 using GitHub webhooks, OC describe, uh, X signature, yeah, it's fine, in GitHub, it says, oh, change it to application JSON. Yeah, well, there you I go. I wondered as if we had the type wrong, because that's what the, the error seemed to indicate. Oh, you're so smart. Application I JSON. mean, he wrote a book. You wrote a book too, Eric. But I wrote like I, did. I never wrote uh, No, you didn't write a book. Andrew no, wrote a book. Sorry. I, ain't nobody got time for that. The same. <laughs> All right. Application JSON. Okay, we're good. So um, in our gem file, we are going to need to define the Sinatra gem. 
And so I think I can just do, well, you know what, gem file syntax, because I don't remember. Oh, I don't really, really? Krishna says you need to click files. update. I need to click update. I did click update. I'll click it again. And update. yes, Jay, I think he disabled the SSL hook. Yeah. That's disabled. Yeah, when I click update, it does. It just takes me back. Uh, see, okay, the hook was successfully updated. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. All right, gem file syntax. Uh, source rubygems.org. So we will make a file called gem file, and we will add source rubygems.org. And I don't care about the Ruby version. And then so we want gem Sinatra. We will add our gem file to our repo. Right. And, we'll and add, what? Yeah. And yeah. As, as Eric moves along here, I want to like sort of give a preview for the Prometheus part of the thing. As we build uh, this app out, this gem file will actually become key because it's how we'll add uh, an exporter for Prometheus uh, protocol to, to the app, to our demo app here. Uh, I want to, where's the builds? This is weird. It's build configs, but it doesn't show me. It says builds, but it doesn't show me the build. Anyway, whatever. Builds. In the, yeah, there's your Hey, build. look, it's running. Ta-da. I didn't do anything. It was all GitHub. You can, you can blame GitHub. Because we, we triggered a new build by sending that hook from, from GitHub to this open. When I, yeah, exactly. When I pushed the code, it caused the webhook to fire, which told OpenShift to do the thing, which happens to be a build. So that's what's happening. OK, here we go. It's copying the source code, installing, running bundle install, which is good, which is hopefully going to pull in Sinatra and probably other random dependencies. Oh, sorry. Uh, hey, Sinatra. Woo. Hey, look at hey. that. So maybe this might actually work. Maybe. And it will fly us to the moon. Will it? Or send us? Is it fly me to the moon? Yeah, fly, fly me, me to, to the, the moon. moon. Yeah. yeah, there we go. All right, so the new deployment. Hey, that looks nope. Oh, it's wait. doing something. Oh, it's doing something. It oh. says it's running. Oh. <laughs> you might consider adding Puma. I might not. <laughs> so Sinatra yeah, wants you to add a, a, a wild cat here. Uh, you know, hello, all well, you. It cool says crash the back off, but I thought it was running. <laughs> nope, it's still crashing. It's crashing. Oh. Why? Maybe nope, you should put pressure. a Puma in it. But Sinatra should be able to run all by itself. Like it shouldn't need. No, I'm joking. You shouldn't have to do that. You're right. Configuration app groups. Are, oh, it's using freaking. Oh, is it doing like rack. a default? No, it's app? no, no. It's trying to use rack. Uh, so Christian's rack. question about yeah. So um, rack is like Ruby middleware that. Um, it's hard to explain what era. Let's just ask the internet. OK. It'll probably explain it better than I will. Rack explained for Ruby developers. Here we go. So it's it sits between Rails and the web server, but the okay. way that the builder image is configured, huge mistake. Oh, you got to get a cheat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the way that the Ruby builder image is written, I think it expects rack and so if you look at the error message that we're getting it's complaining uh, there's no config.ru found is that, that's a rack which is a rack up file okay that makes so sense so now i just need to quickly sinatra ruby rack because there's probably yeah, a so, way. go ahead so my question there is going to be did we fail to generate uh this rack up file or did we generate it and it's not in the expected path no because it's because it, it reminds it's me of like target run. not war for uh for nah, this is gonna be like a like a s2i run problem um it's whatever whatever that source to image image uh, github.com scl org ruby uh, i'm pretty sure it's this one so now we're getting into kind of some of the bowels of source to image. If we look in the bin, if we look at the run, so 
um, if Puma is installed, which it isn't, mm-hmm. otherwise you might consider adding Puma. Okay, fine. If bundle exec rack up is null, then exec this, otherwise exec this other thing. So I think what it's doing is this, but that's actually failing. So that's why it's crashing. Um, rack is not installed in the image. So we're not getting this image. Or, or sorry, we're not getting that error, right? It just says you might consider adding Puma. It says configuration, config.ru is not found. So I think if we have a blank file, that we'll be OK. Um, so we'll try. Will, will that be a blank file for the Puma doc? No, it'll be a config.ru. Rack, okay. So rack up dash E is, uh, yeah, it's just, it's defaulting to look for config.ru. I mean, actually, Puma might make our lives easier. So maybe we could Puma. I don't know. Should we Puma or should we try to fix whatever's going on? Whatever you think is best because you're the Rails mm, expert here. But this is probably going to blow up without a Puma config. Well, maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. Well, let's try adding a config.ru that's just empty. Um, config.ru. By default, we'll only set up session configured. In case you set config.ru, run with backup, require my app, run my app. Yeah, I think we need to do this. So let's try this. Class my app Sinatra base. Is that what we have? Let's see. App. We do not. Run if what? Hmm. This is annoying. Modular versus classic style. Configuring. Okay, so let's do this. Oh my gosh. People need to stop texting me while I'm <laughs> <laughs> Someone literally just texted me a picture of them watching Twitch. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nix. <laughs> oh, Will, Will Nix? Will Nix, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Hey, thanks, buddy. Um, all right, so we'll do that. And then it says something about serving a module application. We don't care, but we do want the config file. I'll run my app RB. Okay, so. This uh, new file. There's probably, you know what? There's probably like an OpenShift Sinatra example somewhere. That Wouldn't would just, that be that a thing? Be, that'd be cheating, though. I don't want to do that. Let's see. So it's referring to my app. My, okay, cool. And then my app, which we have in here. Yes, my app. All right, cool. Adds config that are you stuff? Hey, look, we're gonna get another build. Uh, builds, builds, builds. Number three. Wow, that was fast. Here we go. Crap, that wasn't Will Nix. Somebody who. Never mind. It wasn't Will Nix? I thought you said it was Will Nix. Uh, Well, Will Nix was in the, it was like a chain. Rack manages middleware, not the Java kind of middleware. So so again, to kind of contextualize some of this a little bit, um, while we haven't yet had a running server as a result, what we are illustrating is uh, S2I builds in OpenShift, assembling all our components, building them into a container, depositing that container into a container registry accessible to OpenShift, and then deploying that new build on on the cluster. So uh, like we're seeing a lot of developer convenience steps uh, assembled by by this, this process that we're running through. We got more gems now, maybe. I don't know. All the gems. Gemtastic. We may have gotten those last time. I just wasn't paying attention. Perhaps this should have been planned more. No. No, that would be failure. No failure is part of the fun. No, exactly. Like learning in public. If you, if you just want to see a demo, afraid. go to YouTube. Right. We 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 learn in public here. Well, we we do things that should probably be learning, but anyway. Okay. 
Fingers crossed. Maybe it worked this time. Ooh, still blue. Details. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Logs. Hey, hey, woo, I fixed it. Good job. You might consider. No, I don't want to. <laughs> okay, so we that. have a route for this thing, um, which we can see uh, this button here, open URL. So when I click this, I get my hello world. Hooray! Yeah, which I think it is, again, really important to underline that OpenShift assembled all of these pieces along the line for us up to and including giving us a URL where external clients can access this uh, contrived service that we're using. Yes. OK, awesome. All right. Now, if we look at the details on this pod, we see some pretty basic stuff. Memory usage, 32 megabytes. CPU, almost nothing. Network, basically nothing. Right, But this isn't necessarily all that interesting or valuable or, or useful. Right, because right? None, like of it we, is, it, none of it is particularly application specific. These are exactly. in fact statistics about the pod in which our application is running. Right. So, so if we want to drill down and know more about the behavior of the internals of our code, we need a way to instrument that. Yes. So um, if we switch back to the administrator view real quickly, Actually, wait, it was here in the developer view, monitoring. Whoa, that's that's a new thing that I've not seen wow, before. Wow, and it is beautiful. It's it's certainly colorful. <laughs> what is it? Oh, nice. Rate of received packets. Wow, that's exciting. Mm. That's a lot of metrics. Yeah, that's again, nice. and these are metrics that out of the box we have on OpenShift just about any particular deployment we've made or deployment config. We've, we've... Oh, I may not have to. This looks like it might be turned on already. Um, hmm. Well, we'll see what happens and maybe it'll work or maybe it won't. Okay. Um, if we go to the documentation again um, and we find the monitoring, there we go, monitoring, monitoring your own services. Um, by default, well, actually, I'm going to go back to the OpenShift UI. If we go back to the administrator view, and we go into monitoring, and we go into metrics, we have a lot of interesting, uh, oh, man, that's not what I was hoping for. Can I see? No. Um, ah, here we go. OK. So the cluster is already configured to fetch all kinds of metrics about stuff. Um, and so essentially when we build OpenShift uh, and then when we install it, we pre-configure the cluster to be doing lots of metrics exposition and ingestion, right? And the way that we do that is with Prometheus rules and service monitors. I think I got that right. So if I go to actually I'll do this in the UI because it'll be fun and it'll be an experience. If we look at CRDs. Um, so it's a, I'll, I'll give a little background here. Sure. In that this thing yeah. called a service monitor is um, a, a CRD, a custom resource defined in this cluster's Kubernetes API that describes um, an additional uh, data monitoring point or an application with a set of monitoring points that, that we want to be able to describe to the cluster and have it start fetching those uh, those metrics yeah. for us, right? Yeah, and if we look at the instances of service monitors, you'll see that we have all these existing service monitors. These are the built-in ones inside OpenShift that tell the cluster monitoring to look at, for example, the API server, or to look at, um, the marketplace operator and collect metrics on the marketplace operator. Right, and so right. On and, so and architecturally, even these are a really cool thing to look at because they give you an idea of how we're, we're extending Kubernetes features in OpenShift in Kubernetes terms. So a CRD, because it has a, a, a is a, a known format with a, with a, a, a standard way of expressing some set of data, means that other developers, other communities within Kubernetes have a way to 
uh, describe this and talk about these these ideas of service monitors intelligibly with one another and that we can bolt them on to any Kubernetes cluster because they're built out in terms of extending the Kates API itself. Yeah. Um, so we've been shipping this built-in cluster monitoring for a while now, um, but we have, oh, I'm missing. Anyway, not important. Um, but we haven't been, um, sorry, I just realized I wear like a sleep ring and, it, and I'm not right. wearing it right now. And I have no idea what I possibly could have done with it. Oh, I washed my hands and I took it off. Okay, it's downstairs by the kitchen sink. Never mind. Sorry about that. Brain <laughs> totally like I, my brain just went over there and it, it was gone. Like it was done. There was no coming back <laughs> until I went through that whole train of thought. <laughs> I almost had to like walk away and start looking for this thing. Anyway, so um, the cluster monitor has been there for a while and we didn't really give you a way to monitor your own applications. You basically had to like, self-install your own Prometheus instance, which is pain in the butt, right? So with 4.3, OpenShift 4.3, and still now in OpenShift 4.4, we give you a tech preview ability to tell OpenShift to use the existing monitoring stack to, um, to look at your services that you define. Um, and so it is looking throughout the cluster for service monitors and Prometheus rules to pick up. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is look at the docs and figure out how to turn this on so that it will uh, look for our own exported metrics. Uh, and then we'll try and turn it on. Right on. So the prerequisites, make sure you have the config map object with a thing. So let's see. Oh, so someone in chat is saying you're looking for service monitor. We've already gone over that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a while. Yeah, that's a while yeah. back. Okay. Sorry, it's okay. Um, cluster monitoring config config map. Okay, OC get config map. Uh, cluster monitoring config in the OpenShift monitoring namespace does not exist. Did I spell it wrong? Cluster monitor Touring. I don't think I spelled it wrong. Hmm. Hmm. It doesn't exist. You can enable it. Maybe we're going to create it. <laughs> Because it looks like it looks oh, pretty. Oh, it's still on tech preview. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it's still on tech preview. But the but so here's the funny thing, right? It's like prerequisites. Make sure you have it. Right. But then, Oops. I. By it's the way, just, it's worded badly. Yeah. It's fine. It, yeah, I would I would agree with that about the doc. But it seems to indicate that if we create it and then edit it to have these contents, yes. we'll get. You know, we ought to be we, able to we move get there from here. Hopefully, hopefully. biscuit. So we're going to use a combination of, I guess, is does this need to be bright? Is the dark theme making no, it difficult? No, I think it's fine. Okay. I think it's fine. So we're going to create a new file. We're going to paste the YAML content into this. Uh, we're going to save it in temp. Uh, CM config YAML. Okay. Name uh, is cluster monitoring config. It goes in OpenShift monitoring. Tech preview workload enabled. True. Okay. So we will OC create this file, success. Uh, one thing to note, only a cluster administrator can do this thing, right? right? So in theory, if you're not the person who owns the OpenShift cluster, you need to talk to that person to ask them to turn this on. Um, so we are enabling a feature in the monitoring solution. Save the file. Monitoring your own services is now enabled automatically. Uh, you can then check if the Prometheus workload, Prometheus user workload pods were created. So if we run this command, um, maybe it hasn't succeeded yet. So let well, you, us. What? No, please, please go ahead. Sorry, I, I misread something. Mm, Okay, what do we want to do here? Get pod dash a grep dash i Prometheus. Um, Prometheus yeah, it, operator cluster. Oh, okay, it started. So here's yeah. user workload monitoring. 
Oops, wrong command. There we go. Okay. At this point, we have told via the config map, um, we told the cluster monitoring solution, hey, well, technically we told the monitoring operator stack, hey, we want to monitor user workload, which resulted in this news operator and other stuff getting deployed by the existing operator. <laughs> uh, so it's like very Inception-esque. But basically, this is the Prometheus stack that's going to monitor our user workload. User workload. Specifically, right. As opposed yeah. to the, the stack that's already running in the cluster that's monitoring the, yeah. the default statistics and, exactly. and metrics that we're looking at. Deploying a sample service. To test your monitoring services, you can deploy a sample service. We don't want to do that because we are writing the sample service. You can check that it's running. Setting up a role for, sorry, creating a role for setting up the metrics collection. I don't know that we actually have to do this. This enables a user to set up metrics collection, but I, I think I think we can get around that. Good for the role binding monitor. Whatever. We'll we'll go backwards if we have to do it. Okay, so setting up metrics collection. It says to use the metrics exposed by your service, you need to configure OpenShift monitoring to scrape metrics from the metrics endpoint. Wait, we don't we don't have a metrics endpoint. So how do we how do we actually do the metrics endpoint? How do we make and what is that even supposed to look like, right? If we think about Prometheus, um, Prometheus.io, and we look at their docs. Um, I think it talks about, yeah, data model. Um, this isn't really, that's not what I wanted. First steps, overview. Where does it tell me? Mm, bring the server, bring this alerting. Where's the thing? The thing it's discovering, uh, service discovery. I was looking for a better diagram here. But anyway, um, at that metrics endpoint that it's talking about, right? So it says uh, metrics endpoint. Prometheus expects to see a JSON payload. So I'll go back here to look at the um, data model. So metrics names and labels. Prometheus fundamentally stores data as a time series. Every time series is identified by a name and some key value pair labels, whatever. And so it. When you visit that metrics endpoint, you're basically, it's expecting to see this like weird JSON, not weird. It's expecting to see a JSON payload in a specific format that um, tells it about what's going on in the application. We could write this ourselves. The payload is not actually JSON, says MetalMates. Uh, that's true, yeah, it's, it's something that includes both JSON and other things, I think. I might be doing this wrong. Close enough, right? Uh, we'll actually see exactly what it is as soon as I figure it out. Uh, so anyway, we we need our app to send the metrics. We could write something to make it do that, but um, let's see Prometheus exporter. Let's see if there's already a metrics exporter for Ruby. Oh, look at that. There's a Prometheus metrics exporter for Ruby. Most suite of instrumentation things... metrics primitives for Ruby that can be exposed through an HTTP interface. So yeah, just to give everybody like some background on Prometheus, it was developed around the same time as Kubernetes was. So it has been around a while, and it has uh, you know libraries for pretty much every language I've I've come across. Um, it's very 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 uh, handy and developer friendly as well as op operations friendly in my opinion. Okay. So Gem Prometheus client, I'm actually going to do this locally first, just for giggles, because why not screw up my own laptop? Um, CD, OpenShift, Sinatra, metrics, OK, bundle, install. And what this should do is install the Prometheus Ruby Gem. It's the Prometheus exposition format. There you go. Yeah, and so in a, a really short summary form, if we want Prometheus to discover and begin to to ingest metrics from an arbitrary application, 
we need to provide Prometheus with this slash metrics endpoint that, that it can respond with this payload. These libraries, which exist, as Chris mentioned, for a great number of, of languages and runtimes, uh, give us that metrics endpoint and allow us to focus just on defining what metrics we want that, in, that, that endpoint to export so that Prometheus can discover and represent them. If I move the video box from Zoom over here, do you see it? I do not. Not on Zoom. Okay. Now I can Not actually look at you, and it will look like I'm looking at you. Okay. And then what I can do is I can look down, so it looks like we're doing Brady Bunch stuff. Like, hi, Chris. Oh. How are you? Anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay. So Prometheus uh, client got installed. We're good. And now if I uh, Ruby my app locally, it should work. Nope. It exits because now I have to do the rack thing. <laughs> Uh, but you said you were a Ruby developer. <laughs> this, this is how Ruby development goes. This this is this is Ruby development right I know, here. Baby. I know. I used to work in a Ruby shop. I get it. Trust me. Um, <laughs> bundle exec back up. Sure. Yay, okay, nine two nine two. So if I go locally localhost 9292, I should see hello world. And now if I do metrics, maybe it does something. Sinatra doesn't do this. All right, let's figure this out. Oh, do you have to somehow register that that one URL with, like, do you, you have to tell Sinatra? The endpoint is there kind of thing. thing. Yep, so yeah. in my app, so I added it in my gem file. Uh, so it's here, but my my app doesn't, know anything about it right right now my right. app's only loading sinatra so we need to require the prometheus client in the application i think i just pasted over that that's exactly what i did okay um and then returns the default registry create a new counter metric register http requests uh, okay and then so increment actually would do it whenever it's called. So let's do this. We'll create the client. We'll do all, actually we'll do all these things just for giggles. We'll see what happens. Never done this before, like legitimately never done this before. All right, so we have our registry. We have our metrics. We have our registering the metrics. We have this helper function for accessing HTTP requests and then increment the counter. But we only want to increment the counter where the counter should be incremented. So we'll put it here in the slash action. So when anybody visits the application at slash, we would increment the metric, maybe. So we'll see if this actually does something. Um, I need to restart the application and it explodes. Well, HTTP request has already been registered. Oh, equivalent helper function. It would help if I actually um, read. <laughs> Copying and pasting from Stack Overflow for dummies? <laughs> oh, gosh. Here we go. By the way, this is legitimate. I, I shouldn't malign Ruby developers because I really am not one. I'm a I'm a I'm a crappy hacker at best. All right. I am a crappy hacker at everything. Yes. At everything. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So if I refresh my hello world, oh, and it blows up also. Great. Oh. Undefined local variable or method HTTP requests. Uh, hmm. Well, that's because, well, because it gets you did undefined, undefined here. Context of root of oh, it's not defined. Oh, I think I need to do this. Hang on. Let's try. Let's try this. Try well, it's again. Funny, the, the Stack Overflow joke. Um, my my girlfriend is in the middle of some programming classes, which I was trying to help her with on Sunday evening. <gasps> Oh, and we we're working boy. through this Python app to draw some charts. And so, you know, I go and I Google how to ingest JSON in Python, <laughs> how to parse <laughs> JSON in Python. And she's totally. watching me. And she's like, is this like, is this programming? I'm like, it, yes. it is when I do it. Yes. I <laughs> well, but that's like, I mean, I know, I know we're sort of getting like a little off topic, but the thing is like, there's no excuse for not 
I mean, sure, there's excuses, but like legitimately, what's the excuse for not learning programming? Like you can legitimately sit in front of Google and 400 <laughs> other <I> free services <laughs> and, and build an app doing nothing but search and like free training online. I mean, it's we, this is awesome, right? Anyway, so it is working now. I just refreshed, right? Yes, it is awesome. <laughs> and now if we go to metrics, hopefully something. Fingers crossed. Nope. Aww. Hmm. So there, like, I think I under, like, I sort of understand the hint that it shows at the bottom of that error page, which is somehow or another, either with a slash star that has a handler for every URL under there, or by explicitly defining slash metrics, there's got to be something that tells the HTTP server oh. what to do. Yep. Or we got to keep door. reading, or we got to keep reading the directions. <laughs> Oh, so there are gosh. two rack middlewares available, one to expose the metrics endpoint. Hey, that's what we want. That's exactly and one to trace need. HTTP requests. Ooh, that would be cool if we were doing like Jaeger or Service Master or something. It's highly recommended to enable gzip compression. We are totally not doing that. All right, so now we need rack and the middleware collector and the middleware exporter. We're not going to use the deflator, but we are going to use these two things. Um, where does this go? Does this go in my config.rackup file? Oh, duh. It's like telling me right here. It would be great if I would read what I'm actually copying and pasting from Stack Overflow. Well, you're not oh, okay. walking right now, right? No, I'm just standing. Okay, so you're standing and programming. Like, that is two difficult things, I feel like. <laughs> I was walking the other day, but my wife is like, you know, I tried to watch your stream for a little bit, but I just I couldn't deal with the like your head going back and forth. It's oh, really? driving oh. me crazy. So. Okay, well. Um, I don't know that this is going to work right, but so Ryan, you know what? Those use lines is what Ryan is saying. Or Ryan. Jar Alex. Jarvan and I can't what, say what that. about the use lines, Ryan? Yeah, Ryan. Ryan, would you like me to DM you the Zoom link? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, are you Rubyist? <laughs> can, you, can you save me from myself? <laughs> All right. I've loaded, I've, I've followed slightly more directions, and now we will go to the metrics endpoint and. <gasps> oh, yay! Hey, look at that. Okay, but no, look, there are no HTTP requests, right? Like everything's commented out. Mm -hmm. But I think that's because since I started the server, I have not visited the regular slash URL. So if I go to the regular slash URL, I should see the, the hello world, which I do. Mm -hmm. And now if I refresh this page, I should hopefully see that there was a HTTP uh, recorded. Oh, wow. Data. Look at all that data. That's a ton of data. Yeah. HTTP has 1.0 because, you know, fractional requests are a thing, apparently. Oh, and so now if I refresh my well, it's page. Actually to, this is a, like a worthwhile point to make. If you observe the data model that we were looking at for Prometheus, they're all floats. So there, there's no way to just export an integer, which is why you have mm, 1.0. Okay. So... Lilik Kazik says that these are not comments. These are help and type metadata. Mm. Smarter than we are, everybody. Yes, Lily is right. Yeah, well, Lily so, is yeah. from the Prometheus team. Yes. Oh, Lily well, is kind of brilliant when it comes somewhere. to Oh, man. So, I, I, Lily, I apologize that <laughs> you are probably doing that thing where you're sitting and watching the television and you want to like strangle the person <laughs> on the TV and just Do watch the way. life like disappear from their eyes. I get it. It's cool. I'm sorry this is so painful, but whatever. So anyway, look, we've got requests. This is awesome. Um, but we haven't made it work in OpenShift quite yet because first we have to commit our code. Um, wow, what just, oh, apparently we have files. Oh, well, he says no worries, by the way. Nah. Everybody's worried. That's a lie. I don't believe you. All right. I need to get ignore because I want to ignore the vendor folder. Sweet. Okay. I, I can't ever remember if I'm supposed to ignore git gem file lock or not, but we're going we're gonna to go with it. So this is adds Prometheus support because that's a cool commit message. If we go back to OpenShift, if we go to the developer view, go back to builds, 
go back to Sinatra, look at the builds. Here's build number four. Look at the logs. Wait for the logs. Um, I don't have that many Harry. nodes. I'm surprised that it uh, that it takes wow. a long time for hmm. copying blobs around. Some of these images are kind of big, though. So it's cool that it has my commit message in there. It's very nice. Also has your email, so look out for that. I'm pretty sure that if somebody wanted to figure out my your email, email would be pretty email, easy. Yeah. They yeah. could probably do it. This is why I just put it online. That way I know like everything is going to get blocked at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you're sure you're, you're trying. Uh-oh. Oh, exit one. Hmm. Um, find Step spec. around the S2I assemble. Find bundler required by effort source. Oh, yeah. Okay. I knew it. Oh, what's the problem? Um... So the gem file lock, which is like the state of what's going on, uh, is because I used bundle to install this thing. So I, I actually want to remove this from the repo. Just This is like a, another artifact of how um, OpenShift wants to do the builds, I think. Like, I'm not totally sure, but just whatever. We'll go with it. So um, let me add it to the git ignore as well. I'm sure that somewhere buried in the S2, here, look, oh, fine. Okay, now you made me do it. S2I Ruby. If we go and we look at the assemble script. Um, okay, so what does it do? It's for those applications that are using Rack, it puts them in production mode. Um, it has bundle installed already in the base image. So it does this thing, installs the application source. Uh, bun building your application source, whatever. Uh, and then it does bundle install. But I think there's something that it does when there's already to my LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, where was oh, I already deleted the file? What was the error message? <coughs> uh, could not find bundler 214. Yeah, so I ha I'm using a different version of Bundler, and that got baked in. And so basically, it was like, well, I'm trying to do this thing. Oh, but I'm not the right version, so it blew up. It's fine. Yeah, so, fix it. Yeah. So add the gem file lock to the git ignore, remove it from the repo, lose gem file lock, git push, uh, builds, five. Here we go, logs. So exciting. By the way, as somebody mentioned, uh, while my email address is available through my LinkedIn profile, feel free to send me a LinkedIn connection request. I'm happy to uh, entertain yeah. all technologists. I do Same many man. things alongside my Red Hat work that require uh, a, a good network of peoples. Mm -hmm. so happy to Happy to connect. I will find your LinkedIn profile and drop it in chat. Oh gosh, I don't know if you want to do that. I'm doing no, it. I'm doing it for totally all of us. That. You can totally do that. <laughs> yeah, the the, the I, I gen. It's funny. I'm more selective about Facebook than I am with about LinkedIn. Oh, totally. Um, so totally. like, I I will. There there are virtually no LinkedIn connection requests that I will reject, unless they are like super obviously spammy, like. The only reason this person is connecting with me is because they're probably going to immediately try to sell me something. Right. Uh, and then even then, I usually accept anyway. And then my response is just immediately like, no, thanks. <laughs> but whatever. Bye. Yeah, no, I get the, I get the, hey, I wanted to talk to you about blah, 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 blah. And it's like, disconnect. Sorry. Nope. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that built fine. So that fixed the problem, removing the lock file. So if we go back to our topology view, we have an app deployed. Um, we see it's the fourth one. So this is going to confuse people, right? There's a dash four in there, like the number four. But this okay. was the fifth build. But 
the reason that this is dash four is because the fourth build failed. So there was no fourth deployment with the fourth build. So now the fourth deployment of this thing actually is the fifth build. But like nobody's really going to be looking at this stuff that closely. But that's why, if you're wondering why the numbers mismatch, it's because this is the fourth time it was actually deployed. Anyway, so uh, we have this open, I think, already somewhere, this app, maybe. No, all right, I'll just open it again. OK, we visited the app. This is good. And now if we go to the metrics endpoint, fingers crossed, everybody. All right. Nice. We Beautiful have down. somewhat lift off, lift off. Okay, cool. Don't worry about that being small. You don't really need to read it. Okay, now where are we at? So we have the cluster open shift has been told to look for user uh, look for user stuff. Exactly. Yeah, and we now have an app that makes stuff happen, exports metrics. So now we need to tie the two things together and tell the cluster Prometheus to actually look for the metrics. So let's go back to the documentation. Uh, and so we need to create a service monitor, uh, which tells the Prometheus what, uh, what endpoints to actually consume. And so this is where it's going to get a little, a little weird. So let me copy, copy pasta, as Chris Short likes to say. Copy pasta. All right, new file. Close this. Uh, we're going to paste this. All right, uh, I'm going to turn off the terminal here. We'll write this file as slash temp slash service monitor YAML. And then we get cool formatting. OK, it is a type, oops, type service monitor. Um, I don't think it needs to be labeled. So what does it say? Of course not. So we're going to delete that for now. We're going to call this our Sinatra monitor. And it lives in the, oh boy, metrics playground? Metrics, metrics playground. Metrics playground, namespace. Endpoints, selector match labels. This is all weird, right? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the Prometheus documentation to explain better what, um, uh, where's the uh, operating? No. Nope. Metrics names and labels. Yeah, I want the service monitor spec, basically. Guides, so instrumenting a go. Oh, where's Ryan? He probably has a link bookmark somewhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and of course, of course, Lily's probably just laughing at us now, eating popcorn and like yeah. throwing stuff at her monitor. <laughs> just do that. There we go. Getting started. Service monitor. Service monitor tells it which services. So, so here, ah, service it, monitor well, is a CR thing, Prometheus right? so, operator, not a Prometheus itself. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> so the key word here is service monitor. It's not pod monitor. It's not deployment monitor. It's not replica set monitor. It's service monitor. The Prometheus right. resource well, includes a field us. called service monitor selector, which defines a selection of service monitors. Anyway, so the key Let's here I is that there's a Kubernetes service that Prometheus is going to look for to monitor, right? It's a service. Right, and that service will be durable in the face of rebuilds, redeployments, pods mm -hmm. dying, pods mm -hmm. being scaled. It gives us a, a, a reliable endpoint to, re to reach the implementers of that service behind that. So a service is, a, is an in-cluster load balancer among a group of pods that, that implements some, some arbitrary service. Yep, and so if we look at the YAML for the service, we see that it has a label of app Sinatra metrics. So the match labels is going to be app Sinatra metrics. 
Well, it's it's. Sh- I think it'll actually just be Sinatra metrics. I, I think the app oh, is. You're right. Sorry, my bad. The, there was no app in Docs. The, the key was app, and the value is Sinatra metrics. Right. And then the important thing is this section of endpoints is looking for the name of a port defined in the service. If we look at the service, the service has a port named 8080 TCP. So the port that we're looking for is 8080 TCP. That's the name of the port. We're going to query it every 30 seconds. That's fine. The scheme is HTTP, which I believe is as opposed to like gRPC or something. I lost the docs. Oh, where's the docs? Service is discovered by service monitor. Endpoints port. We could probably have left it out. Yeah, OK. Um, we're probably going to have to do some rbac stuff, but it'll be fun. rbac stuff. Um, OK, so scheme HTTP, yes. So we will save this, and then we will create this file. We'll see, create temp SVC monitor dot YAML. OK, OC get pod dash A grep Prometheus. And what I'm going to do is for giggles, let's look at the logs. for that pod and see what it says. Um, Prometheus key, workload, deprecated, spec image. Just looking to see if there's anything interesting in here. Get namespace, does not exist, that's fine. Okay, cool. Let's look at the logs for this one, just to see. Does it say anything interesting? Oh, gosh, OK. Um, rules config map reloader. Oh, man, I don't even know. Basically, I'm looking to see if like it was figured it out that it's supposed to do something. Completed loading of configuration file. That's not interesting. Mm. Workload one. Also not interesting. Never mind. Paul Phantom says, and it is here. Yes, that is the service monitor. Just go to the target's endpoint of the user workload Prometheus UI. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, oh, does it have a route? There's no routes in the user workload monitoring. Query your metrics console. Well, yeah, I know I can query. I was trying to prove that like the metrics were there, but sure, let's let's query them. Okay, metrics. So like query custom oh, show prompt QL. That's what we want. Uh, well, what? I guess HTTP requests. What are you... Oh, look, yeah. stuff. HTTP request total. How do I run the query? Just hit enter. Oh, there you go. Magic. No data points. OK, well, that's because we haven't hit the thing yet. Um, I'm watching chat for Paul to say. Yeah, we did it wrong. Are. OK, so I just hit a bunch <laughs> so Lily of. So says just go to slash targets endpoint of user workload Prometheus UI. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. How do I? On the targets, is this supposed to refresh itself? Target endpoint. Hmm. Is it zoom? HTTP requests total. Enter. None. No hmm. routes yet. Coming soon. But, but you, you can, can port, port forward. forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so the metrics is not yet, but I mean, it's working in the sense that like it's collect. It's it's collecting them. Well, oh wait, it's... HTTP requests. Total? That's not an actual metric, though. Yeah, or you're not generating that, are you? HTTP like, what's in there? Requests. Hey! Hey! There you go. Metrics. Well, 
We did a thing. It's so cool. Open that thing up to the world so we can get more metrics. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Like, yeah. knock, knock yourselves out. Start typing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So to kind of reiterate the key idea here is we deployed a really simple HTTP server app. We added to it a library that exports some counters at slash metrics. And we connected that by describing it in a service monitor to the onboard user workload monitoring and OpenShift. So we've got facilities to draw graphs with it and, and dig into it and, and analyze it right here in the OpenShift developer console. Whoa, people have done the thing. I've done the thing, sorry. You do. <laughs> I, I want metrics, give me metrics. All the metrics. All okay, the cool. metrics. So now we have, um, we have an interesting metric, right? I mean, it's not an interesting metric, HTTP requests. Um, let's- It's a useful metric. It is. But let's let's come up with some kind of imaginary metric, right? So, um, where's the documentation for the exporter? Okay. So, what are the different types of metrics? So we've got counters, we've got gauges. What is a gauge? So a gauge uh, is uh, that's just like a an different instantaneous value. Oh, right. we just set it to a number. Yeah, yeah. Got a histogram. Uh, provides a sum of, that's, that's a lot. Uh, numeric data, labels, all metrics can have labels, preset label values with labels. All right. So let's, let's do something interesting, right? So we're going to use, we're going to create a gauge in here. Um, and you'll, you'll understand why I want to, um, to do this, uh, room temperature, Celsius, doc string, dot, 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 labels room. Set a value, labels room, kitchen. Ah, oh, I got it, okay. So what do we what do we wanna do here? So we're gonna go back to the app. We are going to create a gauge. Um, room temperature is not very interesting. What do we, what kind of a thing do we wanna measure? And the reason I'm doing this is so that we can try to create alerts, right? Cause like we don't want to alert on the number of requests. I mean, we might want to like, maybe we have a really terrible app that after a thousand requests, we need to reboot it, but that's that's not interesting, right? So um, we want a gauge of something, um, maybe the gauge of Twitch viewers. Hmm. Can you so pull that? We'll create Easily? a gauge called, uh, I mean, if we want to go like totally wacko, we can, uh, we can try to figure out how to tie this into the Twitch API. Uh, no, so we're going to create a, a gauge of viewers, or or with a name for viewers with a parent, with no doc string. I'm going to put a doc string in there just for giggles. E too many viewers. Labels room. Uh, I don't know. What does it say? Labels are. Do, do, do labels, all metrics can have labels allowing grouping of related time series. Okay, so we'll call this uh, service and you'll see why in a second. Okay, so we have a gauge. What do we do with the gauge? Uh, gauge set a value, gauge get a value, gauge increment the value, gauge decrement the value. Okay, let's create uh, a new endpoint in our application called Twitchy. Twitchy. And when Twitchy gets visited, hmm, I don't know, let's set a random, how do I do a random number in Ruby? How to get a random number in Ruby? Use rand range, okay. One plus, uh, okay, sure. So it's zero to whatever. So we'll say num viewers equals uh, rand, I don't know, we're not that popular, so 50. So this will give us a number from zero to 50. And then we will set the gauge, uh, 
sorry, I got to go back to the docs. I'm slightly offended by the we're not popular. It should be we're oh, not really? popular we're not yet. Po yeah, that's what I said. That's, isn't that what I said? No, you, we're not you left off the yet, yet part. Oh, okay. We're not that popular yet. <laughs> soon, soon we will be the twitchiest Twitchers. Yeah, well, Out yeah. There. That's about right. Engage.set. Just copy this. Uh, too many parentheses. Okay, so we're going to set this to the num of viewers. We are going to label it as, I think I said the label was service. We're going to call this Twitch. Okay, let's try to run this locally, see if it works. Uh, come on. There we go. Bundle exec rack up. Okay. Uh, if we visit our local host version of this, there's no metrics yet. Oh, well, apparently getting metrics counts is a, uh, oh, so it's a server request, but it doesn't actually increment the metrics counter, but that's okay. We did that on purpose. All right. So if we go to, what did I call it? Twitchy? If I go to Twitchy, nothing happens. But that's OK. Nothing really was supposed to happen because we didn't tell Sinatra to return any okay. data or anything. So now if we go to localhost 9292 slash metrics, we should see. Twitchy. Uh, I have it's at failed. the bottom. Yeah, but I don't see the gauge. Yeah. Maybe because no. I forgot to register it. Oh, boy. Well, Create. Enter new. Gauge new. Yeah, I have to register it. Prometheus register viewer gauge. OK, so we have to reboot our app server real quick. Um, help viewers, eat too many viewers. So it's cool. We're in there. If we visit Twitchy and then visit our metrics, we see that we have 35 viewers, maybe, on service Twitch. Huh. Interesting. Cool. And if I hit that page again, Twitchy, and I refresh the metrics, now we only have 21 viewers. Wah, wah. So I'm pretty sure that's the algorithm. Like, you know how YouTube does the the weird, you never know uh -huh. how many views a thing actually has. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're not going to get the, if you keep pinging it, you'll get a different number every time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we can push this code live now. So this adds a um, adds twitchy endpoint. Push it. And then if we go back to our builds, we'll see that it's building. Build number six is running. We'll wait for this to finish. Actually, while that's getting ready to finish, let's go find the documentation for alerting rules. Creating alerting rules. So uh, the difference between a service monitor and an alerting rule, right? Prometheus uh, is the thing that alerts. And it alert manager is the thing that delivers the alert. So when you're configuring alerting, what you're doing is you're telling Prometheus at what condition to tell alert manager to deliver an alert. So Prometheus collects metrics, collects all the things. And then if the metric exceeds a condition for which an alert is defined, it goes and it calls alert manager and says, tell somebody about this thing. Mm -hmm. We will create an alerting rule for the number of Twitch viewers. Well, actually, well, yeah, sure, we're going to do that. OK. Here's our Prometheus rule. Why is this version alert? This configuration creates an alerting rule named example alert, which fires an alert when the version metrics. Oh, I guess this is the name of the alert. Wait, I need to file some docs bugs here. This would be nice if these were clearer. I have a friend in docs now. We have lots of friends in docs. Well, I don't think, I mean, I'm sure Allie's not watching, but um, she's definitely probably not liking me very much these days. Um, okay, file new. But do file. I need to go do something nice to make up for this? No, it's fine. <laughs> We're going to call this temp service alert YAML, which doesn't make any sense, but whatever. 
So we are going to call this um, Twitch too popular. That's going to be our that's going to be our alert. Metrics playground uh, example. So this is going to be Twitch rules version alert. I got I got to look that up because I want to understand how this actually makes any sense. Come on, there we go. Um, service monitor tells it to monitor service. Prometheus rule. Exposing Prometheus, exposing Prometheus, alerting describes, what? Maybe. I want the syntax of the Prometheus rule. Kind Prometheus, that's deploying alert. My, all right, Prometheus rule, here we go. Well, that's not useful. <laughs> Explain me the alerts. Configuring the alert manager? No. Want to understand what that name is. is. Lily still watching? Lily, where's the documentation for the actual Prometheus rule uh, alerting thing? Uh, like getting right started tells me. Huh? I just saw alerting. Well, so yeah, that's but that's what we were just looking at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I want to understand the Prometheus rule syntax for. So, like, here's the Prometheus rule. Fine. This is I don't I don't even understand. So alert like alert example alert. Is this the name of the alert? I'm I'm, I'm assuming so. I'm gonna go with that. We're gonna find out. So we're gonna call this. Um, it won't work in four three. Alerting on custom user metrics, 4.5 and onwards, is what Lily oh. says. So this is 4.4. Is it going to work? 4.5 and onwards is what she said. And then Paul we'll just we'll, sent me we'll find link. out. Paul just sent me a link on the, uh, yeah, he said yeah. on the bottom of that page for alerting. Yeah, that's where we were. And it, it's not, I mean, it's sort of, yes, it, it doesn't explain the syntax of the alerting. No, 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 no. The actual alerting MD file. This? But yeah, alerting MD on the bottom. Yeah, 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 but it's still the syntax. Like, yes, here it is, but it's not clear that like this defines the name of the alert. I don't even. I don't know. Whatever. We're gonna try it anyway, and if it doesn't work, so be it. Um, expression version job equals zero. Um, I think we're gonna need some code to try this out. Okay. Let's see. So the build completed. We're good. If we go to topology view, we're cool. Um, here's our app. Hello world. That's great. If we go to metrics, we see each too many viewers. Nothing's there. If we go to Twitchy, nothing happens, but that's fine. And then we go to metrics and we should see something. Metrics. Uh, viewers, eight. Wow. People are really bored. OK. They're not bored. It says 35 over here, so you're fine. So here we go. <laughs> Here's the syntax, right? Viewer service equals Twitch. So expression, viewer service Twitch greater than 40. Do something. Send an alert, right? I don't think this is actually going to do anything. Thanks, Paul, because um, it sounds like somebody says this doesn't actually do anything. But you know what? We're going to try it anyway. There's more links. I'm not sure if you saw content of rules, follow Prometheus format of alerts. There's another link. It's a number to... of awake viewers. Thanks, Ryan. It's a number. Clearly, of... you're awake, so I guess we're doing well. Yeah, we're doing a good job here. All right, so I created this Prometheus rule. Um, I have no idea how to figure out whether it's working or not. Um, I. Because alerts do alert do events do alerts show up as events? Um, All resort now. I don't know that I can see them here. I might have to go to the admin view to see them then. Uh, maybe. But I think Lily had said that it doesn't work. It at doesn't all, so. show, yeah. Right, and and so I think if an alert were fired, 
it does show up in events. I mean, of course, most of the alerting machinery is oriented around emailing or ringing a pager or doing actual alert things on the outbound side. But I think that we would have an alert notice in uh, in the uh, in the events, but I don't think we're actually. I don't think alerts are an alert though. based on what Lily has told us. I don't think alerts are events. Yeah, I think you're right, Eric. Their alerts are their own thing. Um, what did this? And I don't even know how to use alert manager <laughs> status. But this isn't actually their, the alerts. This is status. just the status of alert manager. <laughs> yeah, alert manager is the thing that controls what gets like broadcast, right? Not show me everything. Right, like if it's not like click the plus sign next to not grouped. A little bit down, a little yeah. down, yeah. What is that? Watchdog. Huh. Oh, this was showing me all the alerts. I'm like totally looking at it and not understanding what it's telling me. So this is just these are currently alerts that are happening. So for example, alert name. Image pruning disabled, great, okay. Um, so currently we only have eight viewers. So we need we need more, we need more viewers than that to make the alert happen. So let me go to Twitchy. Now, if everybody goes to that URL, that's gonna screw it all up. So please be, oh, do you wow, stop, now we're down to three viewers. It got worse. Whoa, I just totally did something bad. What, this what? is gonna oh there, bad things are gonna happen. Weird beeping in the background. What oh, this mean? is gonna be real bad. Do you still see what you're supposed to see? Yeah. Why? What's up? You lose power uh, or something? Zoom? No, I I have a everything on a KVM, and okay. double page down is changed to the other thing, but <laughs> the monitor is going through the KVM, and I'm I've got um some things on my laptop screen and my main screen in front of me. And so it looks like my webcam has stopped. It does. So, your webcam's fine. Oh, you see it? Yeah, it's not moving. Never mind. That's it's what I'm saying. Fine. Like you yeah, don't yeah, see yeah. me moving it's my frozen. head back and forth. I'm frozen. Yeah. 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 So let me. Uh, how do I get back to the settings here? Um, or turn it on and off again. Settings. That is exactly what I have to do here. <laughs> so we're going to change this to HD webcam 615. And hopefully that's going to work. Is it going to work? It's not working. That's a bummer. Yeah. Nope, there you are on a different camera. Well, a different webcam. So you can be fine. side view now. That's fine. Let me, let me, does this work? Oh, I'm back. There we go, and you're back. Ta-da. Thank goodness. All right. Okay, I gotta be more gentle with the page down button. No, no kidding. All right, what did we set the alert for? 40 something, 40. I think? Is that 47? All maybe? right, so now we're at 47, All which right. is good. If, as long as nobody goes to it and wrecks us, don't visit that URL. Uh, monitoring metrics. We want to look at of course. Uh, viewers. Viewers. Cool. Oh, somebody went to it. Boo. My one, my yeah, fault. We got, we got bummed. Yeah, we're back at four viewers. Twenty nine. Yeah. Thirty six. Come on, baby. Forty three. Okay. Woo <laughs> but I don't think Alert Manager is gonna figure any of that out. Wah, wah. I think those are the same ones from last time. Yeah. Frozen. yeah, these are the same same ones. Um. Still got 43 viewers. Yeah. We're just waiting for. Oh, because uh, the. There we go. OK, so now we're back up. It has detected that we have lots of viewers. Mm -hmm. But I don't think Alert Manager is going to do anything. No. Why is that? Because I don't think it, it works. Well, right? I don't I believe Lily, Lily was saying the Lily thing. Yeah, actually do okay. alerts exist yet. Um, yeah. According so, to what Lily told us, I, I, I arrived today thinking that it existed, but uh, I've, I've learned that it doesn't yet. Yeah, so so maybe Lily can tell us, is it that it's not 
it's just not looking at uh, the alert rules, like the, the Prometheus that's configured for user workload monitoring just doesn't care about Prometheus rule alerts, or is it that the Prometheus user thing doesn't know how to find the cluster alert manager, or what's the... Yes, it, it we yeah. understand that it sounds like it's coming in four or five. The question is like, what part isn't wired together, right? Yeah, now? like what is the missing piece? What just is curious. Missing? Kind like, of in pursuit of finding out what we might wire together to make it work manually. Yeah. Right. But um, I mean, I, you know, we can keep going and, and trying to do other interesting things. But at this point, you know, we've created interesting custom metrics uh, that are showing up in the metrics UI. Yeah, as part I, of our... I think, and, and Eric, if you want to bring that back up on the screen, like that's which, that's the coolest point. We've which, added arbitrary measurements which, to internal behavior. Oh, the, the metrics app. view. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I meant the metrics view or the, mm -hmm. the alerting view back over in the OpenShift console. Because what we've been able to do, and, and remarkably in actually a fairly short span of time, is yeah. take a little app, arbitrarily measure different parts of its internal state, and present them back in graphs right in the OpenShift uh, web console without really having to build out any of the visualization part. Um, all we've had to do is identify an endpoint and had Prometheus go scrape it for us. And we only had to learn a little bit about Ruby to do it. And we only had to learn a little of Ruby. So hopefully hopefully, whoever was uh, disgruntled about us doing software development and app deployment uh, is no, happier don't, now. Don't, don't be disparaging. I'm not trying to be disparaging. Somebody okay. was disgruntled. Legitimately. Oh, well, they're gruntled now. They're gruntled? Have we Is that the opposite? Right in. And let I, us I don't know, know but that's just what I said. <laughs> um, I'm good at making up words. So many uh, words. So many words. I don't. I. I don't. I think we've sort of achieved the goal for today. I don't yeah, know. and okay. I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit funny that that we didn't have an absolutely correct understanding of of the alerting piece, but um, we actually did illustrate a pretty useful process for anybody who's building applications on the platform and needs to measure internal state of that application. Exactly. Um, yep. And with the with the with the knowledge that the upcoming feature is wiring automatic alerts based on these custom counters of internal application state in the very near uh, OpenShift version future. Okay, so Lily has provided us a comment. Sorry for not looking at the camera. Rolling. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to decipher it. I, I understand the global view and multi tenancy piece. You can create alerting rules, but just on your, just on your own custom metrics, not an alert manager. Yeah, no, right. An alert manager is the thing that uh, routes the alerts. Totally got that. So, right. so the question is, technically, right now, because the number of Twitch viewers is is too high the rule exists for the alert. So is there somewhere that I can see the alert? <laughs> like alert being fired or triggered. Right, because I understand yeah. that, you know, alert manager's not finding out about it, but does the does it, does it do anything right Is there now? somewhere else? Just... <laughs> yeah, or to <laughs> right. ask the question another way, like would we have to go all the way to configuring alert manager with a known set of alert targets to be able to observe? I don't even know that we speak. could. Did we, uh, so Ryan asks, in SRE terminology, did we establish a new or custom service reliability indicator? Um, you can see it in Prometheus UI for your user workload monitoring. Well, I can see the value, but how do I how do I see? Is there a query the that's like alert? Would you see it in local host? No, because the application doesn't know about um, right. alerts. So um, I think what Paul is suggesting is that in the admin perspective right the prometheus this, ui the, yeah, the, yeah, well yeah. so this is the prometheus window. ui for user workload monitoring which we never exposed so right. i think we what he's saying really is that. that i would have to expose the prometheus ui for one of those user workload monitoring pods and then we could go to it paul and and see it um so no, port forward the Prometheus user workload. Well, Eric, what port I'm suggesting is... Port forward the Prometheus user workload. And I, and I could be well, wrong. exposing the service would be the same thing as, as if, port forwarding, wouldn't it? Sorry, go ahead, Josh. If go over to the admin UI, I think we have a Prometheus UI. Um, that you yeah, but it's not, it's, 
we do, but I don't think that's the same one because there's a there's a different Prometheus. I, I, yeah, well Zoe understood, says, right? That we have this other Prometheus set of of pods and deployments running to do our our user workload monitoring. Right. Yeah. This this if I click the go to it from this view, this takes me to the cluster one. Not and and the... Paul, Paul and Lily have also further clarified that they, that you're you're correct, Eric. Like what they're referring to is specifically the user workload monitoring Prometheus, um, and they're talking about right. port forwarding to its its UI endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, can I just expose it as with a service? Uh... Prometheus user workload service right here. So can I do OC expose? We're gonna do it. We're gonna. That's right. We're gonna freaking do try it. it. Pro do it live. Yes, user workload. Oh, that's a, a service. Okay, OC get route. We're gonna do it. It's either gonna work or it's not. Eek. Client sends an HTTP request to an HTTPS server. Okay, so right. HTTPS. That's secure. That's fine because I don't trust the CA. Goes. And it doesn't work. Oh, uh, because I think it's not. Hmm. Auth proxy. What about? Oh, do you proxy? have? Do you, do you need to be logged in? No. Because you are logged in. Oh, what proxy. port do I want? Uh, what did uh, ninety-two something? There we go. Oh gosh, ninety-nine. Let's see. Internally, it is. I guess it's ninety ninety one. Ninety ninety, I think. Well, look at the screen. I mean, yeah, 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 I know. It says it's target port metrics. I'm really happy. Oh, I, sorry. I, Lily I is here. On. Like she's actually doing this stuff live. She's checking her bash history now. <laughs> I'm very happy Lily's here. Um, so if we look at the pod, the pod should define ports that it does something with. Uh, 9091. Here's the here's the port that it exposes. 9091. So OC port forward dash H, OC pod, OC port forward pod, Prometheus user workload zero, colon nine, uh, 9091, 9091. Okay, it says it's doing it. So now if we do localhost 9091. Oh, son of a biscuit. Oh, it's thinking. Yay, thinking. it's better. Uh, let me control. Oh, we've been here before. Proceed to localhost unsafe, unauthorized. <laughs> wah, wah. Which I think is probably going to take us toward Lily's comment about OC or about OAuth proxy. I'm yeah. just going to guess because it says. Because I would need to send some kind of token or something. Oh, Lily dropped a comment in here. Cube port forward. You did. Yeah, but that's what that's what I just did. Yeah, we did yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, you hit, you hit cube bar back proxy. Oh, right. Yeah. Is yeah. So I don't think this is going to work. No. But. Could we fix it? Uh, no, because it's because it's configured to want to. Um... There's oh, but ninety ninety oh. is not exposed in the pod. Ninety ninety one is the QBAR back proxy. Ninety ninety is Prometheus. That. I don't understand how that. Oh, I guess the R back proxy in turn. Oh, hold on. Maybe I didn't scroll up far enough. Just do a find. Uh, I think the stanzas Spec are back. Containers, liveness probe, liveness probe. 90, 90, I see, I I see what they're saying now. I just yeah, saw it. 90, 90. Where? 
and scroll up. Well, this like is the low, that's a URL. Sorry. Anyways, <laughs> I was just looking for 99. Well, but that's there's there's probably some awful JQ command to make that work right. So we'll do this. Paul says this is why you need port forward. Da 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 da. da. Oh, connection Can't closed. Reach. No, we know what that means. Well, because it's probably HTTP. Yeah. Ah. Ta da. Alerts. Twitch popular. Yay. Yeah. Look at Look that. Look at that. E too many viewers. Look at that. Kids, we did it. Oh, but I nice. did doubt. And Eric and Lily did it. <laughs> it's really it was it's really all Lily. It was really Paul. Paul. Lily, Paul. Yeah, Paul thank Lily you so Paul. much. I'm, <laughs> that was I'm, amazing. I'm just, I'm just the monkey on the dancing around. Twitch channel with special guests, Paul and Lily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who oh, who by the way, folks, are like at least Lily is in Germany and it's probably, I don't know, Very late, three yeah. o'clock in the morning, right? So yeah. yeah, that's true. It is no, it's like nine PM. Maybe ten. Yeah, yeah I, I mean it's latish. Plus, yeah. But the yeah. fact that uh, the fact that they're willing to hang out with us, like absolutely you know, after yeah, dinner. Thank or you whatever. so much. And and and, and that it. neither of them have managed to kill me somehow through my computer yet um, <laughs> is, I think, uh, that doesn't mean to. they're not planning to. It's only nine p.m. I'm, I'm I will end up dead at some point, inevitably, yeah. in my own yeah. hands. They're, so. they're writing that program iteratively, and they just haven't got it all the way through debugging yeah. yet. Yeah. You're dead the, soon. The, 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 hack, the hacker yeah. Is, uh... yeah. yeah. So Lily says all this magic is now done for you from 4.5 onward. Yes. Ta da. Yeah. No, it'll be cool. No need to port can, forward. Uh... Oh, it says it's not active. Wait, did somebody did somebody change the number of viewers? This is weird. Well, so the number of viewers is is greater than 40, but the alert. I see the alert, but it says it's it's not active. Active. So, so shouldn't it be active? Unless it went down again. Can you go look at the graph over in the UI? I'm looking at the graph. Not the graph graph. 43. Graph. It says right okay. there. Okay. So it should be. It should be on. It should well, be firing. Well, in theory. Yes. Yeah, so what do we do? What do we do wrong here? Viewers, namespace, metrics, playground, service, Twitch, greater than. Is that, the, is that the right greater than or less than symbol? I never get those right. <laughs> it should be. It is. It points at the little one, Chris. Yes. I have yeah. to remember every time. <laughs> <laughs> I have to look it up every time. I used to have a sticky note. <laughs> Still do. It's, it's over there. Now. <laughs> so this is viewers. I'm going to open this in a new tab. There, let's do this. Let's graph exactly what it is. Execute. No data. Hmm. The, yes, the alligator eats a big one. Yes, this is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, why? I'm wondering why. Well, I was always told we point and laugh. Serve, at oh, here we go. OK. Service and Western way of I may have defined my, uh, my rule incorrectly. Oh. Uh, OC get Prometheus rule. No resource. Oh, in the wrong namespace. Dash. And metrics playground. OC edit to popular. No. Viewer service Twitch. Hmm. Oh. What's the metric though? I might have done that wrong. No, viewer service Twitch. So, oh, exported service Twitch. Oh, I think I'm I'm using and I'm overloading a word. Because look at the look at the actual data. Exported you service Twitch. Font size. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Right, so, you're yeah, overloading, overloading a word. Service. So if we look here, the service that's being monitored is it's not from metrics. metrics. Right, um, right, we don't want to measure that. Yeah, so I need to call this alert exported service Twitch. Exported, yeah, there we go. Because if I change my 
viewers to exported service equals Twitch. <coughs> Execute. Yeah, it still works. OK. So once I change this rule, hopefully Prometheus will pick it back up at some point. I don't know what the interval is on which. I think it's 30 or 60 seconds. You know, well, we that's, the, that's the interval for polling that we defined in the service monitor. Right. What I'm saying is we just edited Metrics Playground 2 Popular. We just edited this definition. So the question is, when does Prometheus reload the Prometheus rules that are defined? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it still has not reloaded it, it it's still over 40 right yeah well it's it still says service equals oh yeah, yeah. and not um yeah because this isn't this yeah there we go oh uh, so maybe they'll know no nope. maybe they'll be wait oh, look at that pew pew firing there is a firing alert yeah Bang, bang. <laughs> All right. So now we, we have actually finally succeeded in doing the thing that we set out to do. Almost completely. Yeehaw. Yeah. Now what? And it, yeah. And as Lily points out, that, that recycle time was basically Kubernetes um, recycle time. So it, we're, what we were waiting on is for Kubernetes to go through and reload config maps that had changed. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, whenever Kate's reloads config maps, zero to five minutes is the answer to that question. Yeah, because the my assumption is that the operator makes, and Lily or Paul can confirm, the Prometheus rule is a CRD. Mm -hmm. And so when the CRD changes, some operate, sorry, Prometheus rule is a CRD. Too popular is a custom resource instance of a Prometheus rule. And there's an operator somewhere that's looking at Prometheus rule instances. And I'm guessing it manipulates a config map eventually once the Prometheus rule instance changes, which then eventually gets reloaded by K8s into the Prometheus pod, at which point it hups itself and knows about the new rule definition. Does that make sense? That's a convoluted description, but. <sighs> Yeah, at that point, I think I need a picture, but. Um, uh, here we go. Oh, so you get uh, config remember, map. Remember, I'm just a simple ops guy. Yeah. So see <laughs> this Prometheus user workload rule file zero? Yeah. So if we look at the YAML for that. Okay. Here's our Twitch. That's too popular, rule. yeah. Yeah. Right? So. Okay. So there's a Prometheus rule called too popular in my project. Mm -hmm. The Prometheus user workload operator, this thing, yep. is looking at all of the projects to find Prometheus rules. And so it found my Prometheus rule, and then it found that my Prometheus rule changed. And so it updated the config map with the new rule definition. Nice. And what Lily said about reloading config maps, at some point, K8 says, oh, the config map is different than what is actually in the pod. So mm -hmm. it fixes that somehow, at which point yep. the Prometheus pod is like, oh, I have different rule definitions. And then it, it loads the new rules. And then that's when our alert finally fired. So if we look at the logs for this pod, I wonder if we'll see where it picked up the rule or something. No, it doesn't actually log mm. any of that fun information. That'd be nice if it did. We'd help for troubleshooting. Me. Mm. Yeah. Huh? I mean, nothing. Mm. You know, I mean, okay, so going back to Ryan's right. question, um, you can get custom indicators are relevant for your app's performance. Yes. So to scroll back up to your specific question, Ryan, you said, did we just establish a new service reliability indicator? So the, the, answer to the question is yes with an asterisk it it depends on the context 
of the indicator. So if you could create a gauge in your application, um, you know, that was a metric of health, right? Uh, that was derived from other things going on in the application. Absolutely, the you could now have this be an, an SRI. Um, well, the the measurement would be the SLI and the high water or low water mark of the right. The alert you rule. would define an alert based on the the SRI. And so the other thing that you can do with Prometheus rules, which you have to be careful of, is you can do like derived uh, mathematical whatevers. Um, let me see if I can pull up the docs for it. But there's basically a way to do stuff like um, you can do math basically on a. Um, uh, yeah, which might be a combination a of two counters or yeah. a function of one counter by the other counter or other ways that you want to massage two sets or three sets of data points to make them useful as a high or low watermark trigger, right? Yeah, let me find, yes, let me find the, um, so this is, that would be called a recording rule. Um, right. Sorry, not necessarily a recording rule. Where's the ProMQL expert? Yeah, so you can define recording functions. functions. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like an example of this, that when we talked about this before, uh, Eric, an example of yeah. this that always comes to mind for me is like if I have a, some kind of a sensor that, say, measures temperature, it may not be giving me a degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. It may be giving me a raw count from the sensor that I could then apply simple math to yeah. to get a degrees yeah. Fahrenheit number. Absolutely. It may be giving me I, seconds when I want I'll minutes. I'll give you a perfect example of, of that in the real world. So um, I'm a car person. I like motorsports and car stuff. And so um, my I have a, en a programmable engine computer for tuning the performance of the engine. And so it, it outputs yep. sensor values. And so there's a, a messaging bus that it basically spits out all these numbers. But it doesn't do pressure in PSI or bar. It does it in kilopascals. But right. it's yes. kilopascals in it's reference some raw to number, right? Yeah. But not yeah. only is it a raw number, but it's a raw number that's in reference to atmospheric pressure. So technically, it's already 14 psi, or whatever the current barometer is, like above the actual value. So right. if I want to display on my dashboard in the car the oil pressure, I have to convert from kilopascals to PSI and then subtract out 14 pounds because atmosphere, and then that's the number I can show. So in, in Prometheus terminology, that's a recording rule that would be, you know, whatever the scale factor is for kilopascal to PSI plus 14. And so instead of having to alert on 1,096 kilopascals, exactly. I can have a different thing that's like pressure PSI as a metric and then i can build an alert off of pressure psi but that's a derived metric right right so, and so our i'd like to summarize whether like not intending to be perfectly correct but the idea here being we could have a function that first subtracts a sense of ambient atmospheric pressure yep exactly. and then does a conversion from yeah to from y, this yeah, to something yeah. more something more something stand, like more yeah. humanly recognizable or more easily painted on a gauge in a yep. car dashboard like you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you had a bunch of different metrics that you could mathematically combine in some way to get a single health score, if you will, uh, then you could have a alert that fires when health is below some threshold or above, you know, whatever. Right. right. Um, the one caveat to this pre compute. So if you're doing like crazy math and you're doing lots of crazy math across lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, and lots of rules, yeah, you will crush Prometheus. Crazy math is math where N is large, despite the fact that N is whatever, large. right? Like any kind of mathematical functions, you know, but the more, the more complex your recording rules get, the more horsepower you're asking Prometheus to use, to use every yeah. time it has to calculate. Right. So it is entirely possible that you can crush 
Prometheus oh, by writing totally too many fancy recording rules. Yeah, so just be like, careful if you start to do these, um, you know, the, like sums with square roots with, you know, exponents and other yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's just like any other monitoring system. If you start throwing a lot of, you know, like this metric with this metric with this metric and all the comparison of it, and then you mm -hmm. get this algorithmic thing and then boom, like it's, that's computational time, right? Like the, Prometheus doesn't magically solve that problem. You still have to like account for that. Yep. So as a, as a quick background aside for our viewers, Eric, mm -hmm. what is a race car? Does it have square tube frame rails and a naturally aspirated V8? Uh, no. It's or are you not. an SCCA a, kind of race car guy? I, I, I am an SCCA slash NASA kind of race car person. So, yeah. And so I'll for those who don't know, SCCA is like yacht racing for people who like race cars. Oh, come on. to, you know, NASCAR, which my father actually was, that's what he did for a living was drive NASCAR race cars. He drove NASCAR for a living? Yeah. Yeah. What was no, no, no. If you didn't know this about Josh, yeah, listen to that. Yeah, like my only real, <laughs> my only real engineering background, my degree is in journalism. Everything I know about engineering was from doing trig and sitting chassis up. What's, so, uh, what was his, what was what's his my name? whole his real driver? engineering background? My father's name is Bobby Russ Wood, right out of Talladega Nights. There we go. <laughs> Here, I'll find you a link. Um, hey, look at that. Career stats. Yeah. So we raced uh, what they refer to here as the Southeast Series, and uh, Dad was Rookie of the Year in what was then the NASCAR Slim Jim All Pro Series. Yeah. In 1994. Yeah. Way um, back they, when. We were at the time we were like the uh, third level NASCAR series. The what were the Craftsman trucks and are now like the Camping World trucks actually yeah, yeah, are yeah, now yeah, that yeah. third level. So Sorry, it's like Double A AA baseball. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah, no, I remember. Yeah, now we're talking. That's about super cool, man. That. Yeah, we're gonna have Kindle, to. We're gonna have to have chat. About Kindle it. oil. To, you see down there? Uh, like, we'll leave this after this. But I do. I got. Since we brought it up, I got to say this one thing. If you go down a few rows and you see that Kindle oil GT one, yeah, mm -hmm. that that was my like first professional action in my entire life. I was about fourteen at the time, um, and I I did that sponsor deal with Kindle oil. That's awesome. That was like one of my cool. roles in the race That's super was cool. to do negotiations for billboarding, essentially. Very neat. Look at that. We were racing Oldsmobiles. Uh, a car brand there are probably people on the stream who have never heard of. Yeah. Ryan is actually was that, asking was about that, it. Was that the Achieva body? It was the, the Cutlass. The very Cutlass, last yeah. late model Cutlasses. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the Achieva was later. That might have been... 97 98 or something like that i don't know whatever anywho cool beans all right um uh, well that's cool uh we did it we got alerts and metrics we got everything we got it all, all the things and and we got a little car talk out of it yeah yeah that's car talk you you never have to worry about car talk with me i'm always happy to talk lots of cars yeah. cool beans all right well i got i got nothing chris what do you got Nothing. I got nothing. I would like to Gosh. invite everybody uh, tomorrow morning. First thing, bright and early, 0, 0900 Eastern Time, uh, 1300 GMT UTC. Uh, we are going to talk about OpenShift virtualization, which I am super excited about. Um, and then later in the day, I will be uh, co-streaming uh, an event with OpenShift Commons, where they have our global transformation office, which is Andrew Clay Schaefer and John Willis and Jabe Broom and that whole team. Um, Jabe, I forget his last name, Bloom, Broom, but there's too many names. Anyways, th they're all going to be on chatting with uh, Diane and we'll live stream that here as well tomorrow at noon Eastern, which is 1600 UTC. So you got two shows tomorrow for you. Looking for a packed house. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll get we'll get more schedule and info out as we can set up more infrastructure to get that out to people. We are we're literally doing this as live as we can right now. <laughs> no doubt, as you um, saw from my horrible microphone headphone experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it was plugged in today. <laughs> it, it was actually plugged in. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josh Wood. Thank you so much, Eric Jacobs. Hey, thank, thank you, you everyone in chat, Lily, Paul, Ryan. Thanks thank you patience. all so much. Um, 
have a great afternoon. Have a great evening, wherever you are. Stay safe out there, right? Like, we want to see you back here tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. Talk soon. Thanks and good night.